What is up, Dav? And sideways, you beautiful individuals. Welcome back to the Gun Life. Eric and Mark here with you beauties for an absolutely jam-packed weekend recap. We got game fives all over the place. Stomps, near pentakills, actual pentakills, upsets, and mostly not upsets across there. But we start... In North America, with things coming fully online, we had the Dig NRG appetizer. But the star of the weekend was, of course, that Cloud9 versus FlyQuest matchup. This was the closest on paper, and it actually ended up maybe being the most uh, one-sided series because it should have been 4-0 FlyQuest on this one. You ever see a 4-0 four, four series? Man, you probably did this weekend watching Cloud9 versus FlyQuest. You got to see the full force of a FlyQuest working together in synergy, the five-man group against five players playing their individual best for Cloud9. And I actually, you know what? I'll take that statement back because that was certainly not individually the best from each of these members of Cloud9, but they certainly were playing as individuals out there on the stage. And let me tell you, one person against five ain't gonna work out in your favor enough times to come through this series and it certainly didn't for cloud nine yeah it's and that's bizarre because that was the strength of this turnaround in summer was cloud nine being on the same page having better synergy than they did in spring and basically all the positives they've built up in summer was lost in this week off that they had for the buy i don't know what they did the creativity was gone the synergy's gone you play Cassante Corky four games in a row and that first game you really have no business winning you get it on a slight overstep trying to kill the Nexus for FlyQuest I can't believe the lack of adaptation that Cloud9 had throughout this set really surprised by it both from the coaching staff perspective and we know the changes that have gone through that coaching staff and from the players themselves with cloud nine this is a situation that i think a lot of them should have had a way should have had some type of escape rope some type of preparation alternate strategy type of thing to pivot to if you could immediately recognize okay what we've got on the day what we came in initial stuff it ain't working it's not executing we're not you know uh, getting it set up whatever from FlyQuest, you're getting that resistance you've got to change there was no adaptation coming through from the likes of cloud nine it was simply no 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 this works this we're gonna get it we're gonna execute we're gonna this is gonna change around run it back in this type of situation that was not the call to go through if you were looking at this uh uh series and you go to the side of FlyQuest and what went right that five-man group you got Bwipo and Inspired, your two big leaders making big contributions, whether that's Bwipo in lane or Inspired going through all the other lanes around the map, making sure that stuff goes on right for FlyQuest. And then you got the additional support. You got the additional damage, everything else coming through from every other member of FlyQuest. I'm talking about Quad in the mid lane. And of course, Masu and Busio down in the bottom lane. Masu and Busio really stepped it up in this series in lane in that 2v2 and out of lane when it came to the team fights. Yeah, and that was kind of the main spot you were looking at Cloud9. Having the bigger advantage was the Berserker Vulcan matchup. And yeah, they go. Masu goes deathless the last three games in this one. How about after that close game one? It was 44 to 11 in kills for FlyQuest and culminating in that game four where they don't get a single kill they just this looked like top lcs teams at worlds they just kind of rolled over and lost the game but we're still in the lcs this is too early for this to be happening and an important check-in for this cloud nine team is with thanatos in that top side again another one in that same pairing along kind of jojo pian where you're rolling through that same champion time after time and that Cassante was not the answer certainly not uh, one that was providing what it needed to provide for it to be a valuable pick for Cloud9 to be going after, and especially then into someone like Bwipo, who is going to be probably the most prepared top laner in the LCS to go against something like a Cassante, cook something different, cook, uh, you know, or take this and know what he's giving up and what he's gaining with a champion. I think that e example of a veteran player in Bwipo was a difference against Thanatos in this series. Guaranteeing a top three spot, FlyQuest, uh, heading to that world championship. They've earned it. They absolutely leveled up in this series, and they're going to need to level up 
in the next match against TL because they were they were speed running their way through 100 Thieves in a matchup that some people said maybe 100 Thieves could actually make some noise in this series. No, they were silent. We're talking about a 17,000, 11,000, and 12,000 gold lead across these three games. 100 Thieves had three turrets. Three turrets total in a best of five. It, it's hard when you look at this series because there wasn't really necessarily anything that was going crazy bad for these 100 Thieves. And I think you can maybe uh, crazy bad because bad was the gameplay you were getting from General Sniper up on the top side. So we can we can categorize bad, just not super bad. Uh, and then you look at it though, and it really was just about how good, how perfect Team Liquid was on the day and how they executed through. And that is where you can be excited as an NA fan to see them execute at this type of level, continuing through a playoff situation, adding a little bit more pressure, a little bit more spice to it, and you get what you want to see from this Team Liquid team. APA and Jan, your two young leaders popping off. And hey, how about a wild Orn going through and going crazy for your boy Impact in game one? I, I, was, I was cheering, hoping my man was going to get a pentakill. But even a nine kill Orn is something you are definitely not seeing. But yeah, three different picks Impact was dancing not just on Sniper, but he's out playing dives as we're accustomed to seeing uh, on the Gangplank in that third game. An absolute masterclass in the top lane. Pretty much a masterclass across all five roles for TL in this set. And it's one of those things you see in traditional sports a lot of times when you're trying to get you know, just the right mix, right combination for a team. Sometimes you go the all young angle. Sometimes it's all veterans. Sometimes it's that special mix of those youngsters and the veterans and you get that energy from the young players that new innovation and everything else combined with the savvy the knowledge the experience of these veterans this mixture on team liquid has got to be the mo one of the most perfect mixtures of that youngsters and veterans type of squad that you've got and they're certainly putting that to the test and proving it here in the lcs playoffs what do you do against the mental warfare when a dude is typing three oh, zero no. Get ready for Dignitas, and you're like, you're five minutes into game one. It's one thing to have to deal with APA's trash talk, the all talk, everything like that, when things weren't going maybe the way for Team Liquid. It's a whole other deal when this dude is stunting out on the rift and the rest of his friends are also stunting out on the rift and making sure that you're having a horrible time out on Summoner's Rift. It's easier to meme, too, when you see that dig NRG series beforehand and... That was a throw fest back and forth. I'm going to say Licorice had to drag this Dignitas team kicking and screaming through this set. I don't think anyone is coming away from this set going, uh, this is the squad that's going to make this miraculous lower bracket run to shift all the changes at that top side of the LCS. I, there was, I mean, there's something to be said. I want to mention, of course, with contracts. I think a lot of people saw a very emotional interview with him after that series and talking about it to kind of get, you know, more so that human reminder about these players, about these type of situations and the stress and struggles that they can go through. But at the same time, what we saw out there on the rift, especially from NRG, not good. And necessarily from Dignitas, not much better when you're talking about their type of, uh, you know, hopes and chances when now you're realizing, okay, well, next up is going to be, you know, 100 Thieves going to be a cloud nine in this lower bracket run. That ain't looking too good if you're Dignitas and you had that type of performance. And going into the next year with uh, the new format, maybe two less teams in the LCS, if this is almost an audition for some of these guys, guys like Palafox, even Spica on Dig, like... It's not looking great for teams going to be wanting to sign you in 2025, but it is looking good. As I said, Licorice dragging Dignitas into that next round where they are going to match up against 100 Thieves. Maybe the highest caliber of gameplay from both teams combined over the weekend probably came in the Telecom War T1 versus KT Rolster. And finally, we get playoff T1 activated, and that means... They get to cook a little bit in the draft. We're talking triple AD carries. We had a Lee Sin support for Kyria, Yasuo for Faker, even though that one didn't work out. We saw the creativity back for T1 in pick ban. 
you're cooking. They're cooking at least in the kitchen. They're trying the different ingredients. And one of the things that we know about T1, it's not necessarily if they're cooking straight to the cookbook, making sure that it's following the recipe and getting it out right hot and fresh with the meta. Sometimes it's about going off on your own book, finding your own spice, your own little dash of flavor here or there. And that's where T1 finds their strength and is able to get an advantage on everybody else. This could be an early sign that that's the type of T1 that is cooking in these LCK playoffs. Because yes, we do get to roll through some interesting compositions. One of the ones, one of the interesting changes that we get to this team is mighty impactful with a pentakill to get things going. We're talking about Zeus rolling in the God of Thunder himself on the Olaf in the top side. Yeah, and so often we're talking about the bot lane when it comes to wacky picks for T1. Olaf Aatrox, it's not wacky, but it's kind of, it's off the beaten path so far on the meta. And then of course the Bane. So pretty much all picks across the series were a little different for Zeus. He had a fantastic individual performance and we're accustomed to this out of Zeus, but it feels like in the summer split, we haven't seen this level against the top tier top laners. So that's what we're asking for in the next rounds when T1 advances, but great signs to see T1 picking off meta and Zeus playing at this level. Zay is playing like this. I think obviously the coordination, the engages from this team and what they're going through for the most part was pretty top notch. And what you're seeing from the team, how they're developing, what type of challenge they can provide, knowing the type of strengths and type of big dogs that are still out there in the LCK. Talking about a Gen G, talking about a Hanwha Life, even a D plus Kia, if they find a way to keep going on through, can be some serious contenders to deal with. This is at least a T1 that has risen to the occasion, has shown us a little bit extra compared to what we were going through in the regular season of the LCK to say that there's a different change. There is a step up here. Is that step up enough to take over one of these teams that has usurped them for being at that elite level of the LCK? We're gonna find out sooner rather than later. And real quick for KT, let's be honest, Fakers to go. But BDD deserved to win this series in that mid lane individual matchup. BDD on Smolder was hitting mighty strong, mighty different, and certainly one of those ones where you had to make an adjustment if you were T1. It's one of those things that we always scream about is identifying an individual and an individual champion and saying, you know what? That's cool. You know what? I will give you the check mark. You got this. You're good at it. You're better. You're beating us, whatever. Can you do it on something else? Can you get that check mark on something different? That's always got to be something you push to. T1 does that and it doesn't work out for KT. And we get to add another champion to the pool that Fakers played professionally. Almost half of the entire champion pool throughout his career as he pulls out that smolder in game four. Obviously, T1 did enough to be scary because Gen G opting into the DK matchup. Don't want to play T1 yet. Maybe the LCK told them purely for viewership. Wait till it's a bit later uh, so we can really draw the numbers. But either way, the top four, as you'd expect, LCK playoffs going to absolutely be heating up. The penultimate weekend of LEC action, and it seems like an inevitability. We've got one more obvious matchup before we get to finals, but the mental hurdle that these teams have when they match up against both G2 or even to a lesser degree Fnatic because Mad Lions, they looked like they should have won that series. Obviously, we had some crazy back and forth throws comebacks in games three and four but then following suit with bds earlier in the week the game five collapse man oh man the lec what do you say from this past weekend i love that quickly on on bds because this is pretty pretty brutal to see happen once again you had so much excitement i'm watching these games and i'm going hey here it is finally we're gonna get this type of you know you unequivocal kick to the butt out G get out of these playoffs g2 type of situation from bds and it comes all crashing down slow motion to fast forward it didn't matter how fast it was happening you saw the writing on the wall as soon as g2 picks up that third game win you knew that this thing was gonna go the distance and it wasn't gonna be in favor for bds and when you're looking at Mad Lions, Koi, and Fnatic, you nailed it. Mad Lions, they should have found a way to close out this series, to close out games. Multiple chances, I think you can look at for this one, 
where it is poor execution or poor decision making that ends up being the thing that leads Fnatic to get an opportunity. It's not necessarily about Fnatic making an amazing play. It was really about, oh, here you, here you go. Can you do anything with it? And, oh, you can't? Okay, we'll take it back. And then, ah, can you do something with it? Oh, you, you did this time, and there goes our nexus. That was not a good weekend for the LEC. Yeah, incredibly anticlimactic game five for that one, where it, BDS, or not BDS, MDK is going for a flank on Fnatic and just completely give up the front door, and they lose the set. But, again, there was some some good team fighting, especially in that MDK uh, Fnatic one, but... Uh, mostly sloppy and unfortunately that adds to this sloppy flavor that we've had in the LEC for the majority of summer and you combine that with I I just feel like these games don't feel that meaningful now that we're in the fourth bracket tournament that we've had in the season all three of these teams have now already clinched worlds what are they even playing for now seeding at worlds okay it's, it's definitely been enough time now to examine the LEC format and identify strengths and weaknesses from it. And one of the very clear weaknesses is that you run through this schedule. You run through, you know, uh, spring split, you know, winter split, spring split, summer split, grand season finals type of situation. It's hard to find that investment and they haven't really gotten uh, the extra juice, the extra sauce to make this grand season final, a grand season final where it really feels worth it, where it really feels like this is the one where you got to peak, you got to nail it and everything else. It just feels like any other LEC tournament that we've rolled through and you go, whatever happens here, we already know more or less the standings and how things are going to line up. And especially now that BDS couldn't get it done against you two. And the other note is it's dragged on for so long. If you're playing eight best of fives, they get dragged out for basically a month. There's there's no momentum or any momentum that you have when there is that hype matchup per comeback. You go, okay, I guess I'll wait seven full days till anything happens again. And is this, you know, simply part of the way the scheduling works, the format of the LEC? Is this also in combination with having teams that had shown us promise in SK, in BDS, it, you know, Giant X all completely fizzling and failing out at this type of point situation. And, you know, just before this grand season final and everything else, is that really the answer on why it doesn't have this type of excitement or feel like it has any real importance or weight to it with these results? I don't know, but I know that what is work, what is going on right now in the LEC ain't working and does need to be refixed. Even if we do get the iconic G2 Fnatic matchup again, I feel like it's going to be the least hype G2 Fnatic finals that we've had in at least a couple of years over there in Europe. Probably the actual biggest upset over the weekend is, you call them what you want, the miracle, the cardiac kids, Weibo Gaming, getting it done against top esports, forcing their way into a decisive Game 5 Silver Scrapes and coming up clutch. I love to see. It's iconic. It's actually something slightly different. Still an 80 carry mid, but seeing Zhao Hu on Lucian in a clincher like this was an absolute treat to see. Oh, it hits different. It hits different when Zhao Hu is rolling on these ADCs and especially that Lucian pick that you talk about. Yes, Weibo Gaming advance in the LPL. They make it all the way to the big final dance against Billy Billy. This is it. Buckle up, LPL fans. You've got Weibo in the finals. How does this happen? How do we go through every single week? All of these up and down and disappointment. They're the fraud. They're not the fraud. What's going on here? All of a sudden, hot and rising team going down into this loser's bracket situation and finding the win against Top Esports. Weibo Gaming. How about that? And they'll get their revenge, potentially, against BLG. Obviously lost to them a couple rounds ago in the playoffs. But, you know, six, eight weeks ago, if you were sitting here saying Weibo Gaming is going to the summer finals, you would be given an extra dose of medication because you would have been certified as <laughs> insane to be thinking that. You'd be, you'd be crazy. You'd be straight out crazy, man. This series was also about as crazy as it gets when you're looking through and how things played out. You had a lot of stuff back and forth in this one. I think early 
Tian had the advantage in the jungle. And then as soon as game three rolls around, flip the script. It is all Tarzan all day for the side of uh, Weibo. And then you're looking as well. Game five. This is probably one of the worst game five performances that we've gotten from Jackie Love on the side of Top Esports. Certainly one where not a lot of positive effect, a lot of, not a lot of positive gaming moments going on for the side of Top Esports. This was all Weibo Gaming leading the charge. And unfortunately, it was kind of a rough playoff run for Jackie Love. You know, you can go back to the BLG matchup. There were more sus series than the typical uh, clutch ones that we're accustomed to seeing out of Jackie Love. But uh, Tarzan does it again. All the slander my man was catching early and often in the summer split. He's either winning or losing the game for Weibo throughout. Well, more, more likely he's winning lately because now, by the way, Follow the miracle run from LNG last year's summer. Tarzan back here in finals. It's crazy because, you know, Tarzan, you know, king of the jungle. My man, you, you weren't you weren't even the king of my backyard, you know, throughout this split. The way that you looked and how some of these performances went through. But since the turnaround, since the last kind of month or two of the LPL summer split and through these playoffs, yes, this has been the Tarzan that has built the name. The Tarzan that is established and has been the impact player that we know he can be in the LPL. He's been that impact player that's making that impact going to the finals for Weibo game. Also didn't really have on my bingo card breathe kind of outperforming 369 throughout the majority of this series. So this isn't just the Tarzan uh, Zhao Hu show here in playoffs. Everyone top to bottom for Weibo was playing at a high level in this series. And because of that, deserving their matchup against BLG. They haven't clinched Worlds yet. They have to win the split to do it because TES has so many points from spring. They'll still slide in that second seed even if Weibo wins finals. That's just, you didn't do much in spring, so you're just fixing the format. So that's fine. I get it, but we're excited for this run either way for Weibo. But that is it today for League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you beautiful people. As always, thank you for hanging out. And you know we'll catch you on that flippity flip.